This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your money, your relationships, your mental wellness, your job, your career all of its game. It's all about your life. And that's what we do here on The Ramsey Show every day. Open phones at 888-825-5225. The call is free and some say the advice is worth exactly what you pay for it. 888-825-5225. Odell is with us in Fairfax, Virginia. Hey, Odell, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, good afternoon, gentlemen. I appreciate you guys taking my call. Uh, I've actually been a pretty long time follower so i i do appreciate this well thank you we're honored to have you how can we help um i was recently offered a new position as a software developer with a new company that's willing to pay me twenty five thousand dollars more than my current position with the company i'm with wow i'm conflicted whether or not i should stay with my company since my experience in software development is relatively new and i was also in the marine corps so i had this weird sense of loyalty as this being the first job that i got out once i got out of the service yeah. um and i'm just feeling really conflicted well let's just say this loyalty is not weird and thank you for your service it's you're a rare. great american it's a rare and it's a good thing <laughs> it's we're glad you thing. have it yeah thank you for your service as well um the issue is if if you weren't loyal let's just loyalty is great but let's just look at the path forward for you uh, this company has clearly offered you a job because they think you can do it, whether or not you think you have the experience or not. And so you have to ask yourself, what's the best path for me? If I stay at my current company and continue to do a good job, are they talking about a path? Are they showing me a path? Do I see a path forward? Uh, you have to look at all of those things. But, you know, it doesn't make you disloyal by taking another great opportunity. It's all in how you handle yourself. And I think you're a, a, a high character individual and that's why you're wrestling with this. Am I a bad guy if I leave to take another opportunity? But you have to first say, is it the right opportunity? It may not be the right opportunity. It might be a $25,000 raise, but a horrible culture. Because if you take the $25,000 raise and it's a horrible culture and they don't treat people the way that maybe your current company's treating you, let me tell you something. The $25,000 pay bump's going to wear off pretty quickly. About 20 so seconds. Gotta, that's right. So you're going to have to look at this holistically. First of all, what's right? Is it right beyond the $25,000 pay bump? Yeah, Odell, I'm from the uh, proud, noble hillbilly culture, and we <laughs> value loyalty that's right. like no other culture. No, not really. But I mean, we do value loyalty. It's a big deal. And um, many years ago, when the 100 years ago, when the internet was first invented, uh, I had a young man working for me that came to me and said, we need a website. And I said, what is that? And he said, if you'll send me to a class for $2,500 so I can learn cold fusion, which no one uses anymore, um, we I can build you a website and you can actually people will buy stuff on it. And I went, yeah, right. How much is the way how much is the, uh, is the training? $2,500. And I was paying the guy 35,000 bucks a year. He was an assistant inside the organization. There was just a few of us. There was probably 40 of us, 30 of us. And um, his daughter had cystic fibrosis. Mm. And uh, so he's constantly dealing with challenges at home, medical bills, constantly fighting through this stuff. And he went and got um, cold fusion training. I paid $2,500 for him to go to Oklahoma City, paid for the airfare, paid six weeks later. Of course, the Internet is starting to become a thing. Dave was the last to be told this. <laughs> but, um, uh, I mean, it was blowing up. A guy walks in. I was paying him 35000 offered him 135000 because he, he knew Cold Fusion. Sure. And I had just paid mm. for his Cold Fusion. So, Odell, let me tell you what I did. I helped him pack his desk. His daughter has cystic fibrosis. I'm not paying the guy 135000 in those days mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, and so I, I said, my friend, I love you. Take this job. Yeah. And he was grateful to me. He was conflicted like you were conflicted. But I cared about him as a person and as a dad. And I told him to go take the job. I did not consider him disloyal for bringing me that mm -hmm. uh, situation. And you're not disloyal, son. You're a good man. Yeah. Yeah. You just got to look at the big picture. Is this the right move? Now, here's what happens. There's, we got to remember our humanness. When somebody 
number one, offers us a position from outside, there's two things that happen. Number one, we all feel wanted, and that feels nice. Oh, you want me. It's like being picked on the playground. Nobody ever wanted to be the last person picked. Something about the value there. The second that thing happened that happens, to me all the time. <laughs> but the second I was thing never any happens, good at dodgeball. Well, but Dave, you've done well. And it, it, well, it's proven that all I got hit people. in the head a bunch, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it helped you become who you are. Careful. Yeah, watch out. <laughs> too close, too soon. And then the other thing that happens is the money piece. So I feel good when somebody wants me, but the second thing that happens is it seems like the smart thing to do. Why wouldn't I take but the But am I a sellout? And then you start to go, wait if a you're second. you're a person of honor. Yeah, you start to feel but like But am a I jerk. a sellout? Am yeah. I a sellout? Is it all, am I that guy yeah. that it's all about the money? And yeah. you're not that. Here's an interesting thing. That guy never asked that question. And that's exactly right. And so this is a good man, number one. Number two, realize this, that it's all the way you handle yourself. Leave with class. Yeah, lots of gratitude. Thank you for the opportunity. You've been amazing, just like yeah. you said to the Marine Corps when you walked out of there. Mm-hmm. You said, thank you. You helped me get to be where I am. You guys, thank you. You helped me to get to be where I am. I'm moving on to the next season in my life. Clark is in Salt Lake City. Hey, Clark, what's up in your world? Hey, how are you guys? Better than we deserve. What's up? Yeah, quick question. Um, so my wife and I, are in a little bit of a car bind. Um, Kelly Blue Book suggests that the value of the car is around $5,600. But the issue is that um, it's at the shop, and we learned that it's going to require around $4,000 in repairs to get it. Good Lord. Working again. Did you take it to the dealer? Yeah. That is at the dealer, yeah, because yeah. the check engine light was on. Yeah, and you know that dealer, um, that's but, not uh, a good place to get your car fixed, right? You, yeah, know, it's, know. you know it's double what everybody else is, right? Honestly, I, I've always been someone that just takes it to the dealer. Don't. No, I, well, I'm getting ready to help you with that. Now you're not. Because <laughs> now you're someone okay, that well, wants a better deal than they'll give you. So I want you to get a second exactly. opinion on this from someone else. Yeah. What's wrong with the car? Um, I mean, it's only – it's a 2012 with 102,000 miles. The turbo, I guess, is out. The oil cooler is out. The axle seal um, on the drive side is um, leaking. Well, on a $5,000 so car, all, we don't worry about the axle seal. You're not going to be driving it that much longer. <laughs> we certainly um, don't care about the turbo. <laughs> well, if, yeah, if you can fix it. But, I mean, uh, so I want you to get a second opinion. Yes. If the net result is that you can get it fixed for 3000 would I fix a $5,600 car for 3000 No, I would not. I'd sell it. Okay. So you have the $4,000 to fix the car? Do you have the $4,000 to fix the car? Yes. Put that with the money you get from selling the car as is and buy you another car. Because you're probably going to get 1600 for it, as is, or better. Do you think it's better to just list it as is with the issues and see what I can get for it? I think you'll get a couple thousand bucks for it. And you put that okay. with 4000 bucks, you've got a $6,000 car that's not broken. I would do that before I'd spend $4,000 on a $6,000 car. Now, yeah. I would get a second opinion, and I would yes. quit going to the dealer for major yeah. repairs until you're rich. Because uh, you really can't afford it until then. What must be done for this car to operate? That would be the question I'd yeah. ask with the second and third opinion, too. Yeah, this is a hoopty, so let's just hoop. We don't need to, we don't need to race. <laughs> That's this, right. is, this is the Ramsey Show. Chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper. Jumpstart your CFO career.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. 888-825-5225. We're having a lengthy uh, good old boy discussion at the break about car repairs. Um, so let's just yes. ble- bleed that on over to the microphones for a second because it's a good principle. Yeah. We get we tell folks, drive a cheap car, drive like no one else so later you can drive like no one else, live like no one else so later you can live and give like no one else. Pay a price. I drove a piece of crap. Now I don't drive a piece of crap. Because I don't have to, because I don't have car payments. I never had car payments in the last 30 years, and that means I have money. Whoa, it's a neat formula. And so, I, did I drive a hoopty for uh, ever? No, I drove it for a year. And I got a little better hoopty that really was not, just a quasi hoopty. And yeah. then I moved up a year later into a non hoopty. Mm-hmm. And from then on, I never looked back and bought used cars until I had a net worth of a million dollars, and I paid cash for my cars and anything with a motor or wheels in it. Uh, because they go down in value. I know, not lately, but it's the one time in the history of the vehicle that it has not gone out, down in value, and it will return, people. And that's not just a boomer. It's an economic prediction called supply-demand curve. Okay, anyway. Now, what do you do if you're driving a hoopty and it breaks? A lot of our people are driving $1,000 cars, $500 cars, garage sale car, right? $2,000 car. Okay, these are throwaway cars. They will bring almost as much at the junkyard not running as they will running on Craigslist, okay? Because it's a garage sale car. And anything $5,000 or under is in this category. Most of those cars you do not do major repairs to. No. Because it's not worth it. So here's here's the way the formula works. If you can sell the car, in his case, for $1,600, mm-hmm. and you put $4,000 in it, and the car is worth $5,600, you broke even. Mm-hmm. If you could sell the car for $2,000 and you put $4,000 in it and you sell it for $5,600, you lost $400. So if the value of the car as is plus the repair, the actual repair, not from a dealer, plus the repair is more than the finished fixed value, don't fix it. Yep. And usually, if it's a major multi-thousand dollar repair, that's what you're going to find because you're not increasing the value of the car. Now, if you got a car that's worth 500 bucks and you put 500 bucks in it and it's worth $4,000, hey, you'd probably do that one, right? Yeah. Even if you turn around and sell it, yeah, you'd, I'll give you'd do you do that. I'll give you a real-life situation as Dave is breaking this down. Not too long ago, we just did this. I was driving a, an older Lexus, a 2006, had 185,000 miles on it, running great. Folks, I don't do a lot of driving. So I was I was coming back and forth here, and I've got a kid who's going to be 16, and so we're looking at, well, do we keep it for him? Transmission starts to go. All right? So I go, all right, now I do little repairs. By the way, now this is the Ken Coleman rule. If you like a little risk and you got an emergency fund, every time the check engine light came on, I was like, ah, how bad could it be? <laughs> So eventually I take it in. And just like that caller, they'd give me a list of 17 things. And I was really good at going, all right, if this were your car, what do I need to fix that gets me A to B? This is several years ago. And they, Reset you know, the computer and turn the check engine light off. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised. All right. So the story goes, the transmission starts to go, Dave. So here's the deal. It's going to be $3,800, mm-hmm. which I have to fix that transmission. But my kid's 15. He's huge. And I was like... Ty, do you want this? He's like, I can barely get in it. So we now realized what I would have had he wanted that car, had he fit in the car, I probably would have because the car probably worth about seven. All right. I would have done it for his first car because if he wrecks it, I'm not worried about it. But he didn't want it. So I flipped it. Bad transmission, full disclosure, 2500 bucks cash. Yeah. It's exactly what we did a few uh, not too long ago. So Take that cash and what you would have spent on the transmission and buy him a, something he can fit in because he's a big football player. Guy. That's it. Yeah. All right, there you go. Ta da. Yeah, this, this is the formula. Yeah. Robert is in Utah. Hi, hey, Robert. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, thanks for taking my call, guys. Good. How can we help? Well, I'm uh, curious about I bonds. I see the new savings rate on the I bond is 7%, which is pretty rock solid from what I've been getting recently. But uh, I was curious on your thoughts on that. And then, secondary to that, kind of where to fund that fund it out of Roth IRA or take a little bit out of the 12 month savings that I have. So just curious on your thoughts. Okay. Well, we tell folks to have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses. And, uh, is it, is it, you know, is it available? Is it liquid? And I keep mine in a money market account, not 12 months, three to six months. Um, 7% is a great rate of return on something like a bond. Uh, you're right. 
Um, and uh, it's certainly safe as an investment because it's the United States government. As much as we make fun of them, it's safe. I mean, we make fun of how dumb they are and how much money they spend and all that stuff. But And it's all true, the things we say about them, we make fun of them. But they're not going broke, okay? And so we, the people, are going to pay your stupid eye bond. So, um, you know, you're, you're safe with it. If you want some money parked at 7%, uh, that's an okay medium play. It's not a good long-term play. So you would not use it for your retirement plans because your retirement plans have to outpace taxes and inflation if the retirement plan is taxable. If it's not taxable, if it's a Roth, it has to outpace inflation. Uh, lately, 7% won't do that. Over the scope of 70 years, inflation has averaged about 4.2% according to the Consumer Price Index, which is the measure of inflation. That's what everyone's using in the past 12 months when everybody's screaming about inflation's out of control, we're all going to die. And um, all the drama that you're hearing on news channels all, all, all day long. And it's real. I mean, the, it, it is real. The, you know, stuff's gone up. But if you, if you have an inflation, if you don't make 6 or 7% on your money with taxes and inflation overall in a normal economy, you don't break even. And so you want to invest north of 10% to make what's called a real rate of return. An economist calls it a real rate of return, which is tax, which is a rate of return above inflation, above taxes. And so what did you really make after they, those, after the loaf of bread went up double and uh, you had to pay uncle on, on the money you took out? And so it's okay if you want to park some money there because 7% is pretty sexy in a liquid investment right now. It's not a good long-term play and it's not the play for your emergency fund. So if you've got some money for a medium play, like the money in excess of six months between six and 12, you said 12, you might play it there. Jessica is in Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, Jessica. How are you? Hi. Hi, Dave and Ken. It's an honor to speak with you. You too. Um, I'm a big fan. And um, my question for you is, I will try to keep it brief and let you ask questions. So my husband and I are in baby steps four, five, and six. Good. We are high income earners. We, um, we gross about five hundred thousand dollars a year i love you now, what do you I make <laughs> what do you do for a living what do you guys do um i i work a couple of jobs but i'm a physician and my husband works in graphic design oh good okay now well i'm glad you're and doing so I, well congratulations well thank you that wasn't true a couple of years ago and then we followed your plan and paid off all of our debt may of last year wow um and we, we paid off over half a million dollars Wow. Uh, we did all the, the typical mistakes that physicians make. Yeah. And well, and now we've dug ourselves out of the hole. So we, we are very grateful for you teaching us that. Well, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Um, so my question for you is about investing. I know that you usually recommend match before Roth, mm -hmm. before traditional. Mm -hmm. I do not think we will be making as much money in retirement as we do now. So my husband and I are wondering if we should do traditional before Roth. No, because you will be making as much money as you make now. The reason is the size of your investment account is going to create an income that's in excess of what you make now. Okay. You're going to have so stinking much um, money. You make a lot of money. How old are you? I'm 36. Okay. I mean, you systematically invest $100,000 a year for the next 30 years. I mean, we're talking about $50 million. My numbers don't come out that high when they use your well, I'm, I'm, I'm making but that up, but I'm not. I mean, it's north <laughs> of 20. It's high. between 20 and 50. Yeah. Yeah. It's high. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, and so the, the investment yeah. returns on that are going to approach your current income. And we have no way to predict what the freaking tax rates are going to be when the Island of Misfit Toys gets through playing up there. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm still doing Roth. I'm still doing match to Roth. To, I, I make good money, too. I make more than you do. And I'm still doing Roth first before traditional. Matter of fact, I don't have anything in traditional. I want it all to be tax-free. Tax-free growth. Tax-free growth. Tax-free growth. You really want it to be tax-free when you have a lot of money. That's a good thing, because you don't want the taxes, because it pisses you off. This is The Ramsey Show. Look, I love real estate, and I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. 
That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey to start your approval or get more information. Guys, I got to tell you, I'm so excited. We're on the road again to uh, quote the famous song, right? <laughs> oh, man. Ramsey Solutions is hitting the road. You already know our Building Wealth Live event is coming to Las Vegas and Orlando this May. We're excited to share a few more cities that we're headed to this fall. Uh, get ready. Sacramento, Minneapolis, San Antonio, and more. We're coming for you. At Building Wealth, we'll tackle the latest get-rich-quick trends, dive deep into investing, saving, planning for retirement. What might sound like a lot of complicated stuff, truth is it's way easier than you think. Me, Rachel Cruz, George Camel will be there along with Ken Coleman, Dr. John Deloney. We'll be signing books, taking photos, answering questions, doing the event. And uh, all of us will have something to say to you on this subject. So be ready. So Las Vegas. Orlando, Sacramento, Minneapolis, San Antonio. We'd love to see you. Vegas is May 9. Orlando is May 19. Sacramento just announcing this week, November 1. November 10 is Minneapolis. And San Antonio is November 15. So it's going to be a busy spring, a busy fall. Tickets are only $25. You can get a four-pack for 60 Bring a couple of your friends. It's only 15 bucks ahead. Come on. You spend more than that on pizza. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash events. Get your tickets before they're gone. These first two spring events are very close to selling out. They're not yet. You can still get your tickets, but if you screw around in a couple more weeks, you're going to miss it. So jump in there, RamseySolutions.com slash events. Oakland, California, with a debt-free scream. Jeffrey and Michelle are with us. Hey, guys. How are you? Hi. Hi. How much have you guys paid off? 120000 Yo, how long did that take? Uh, four years and two months. All right. Good for you. Yay. Very cool. And uh, what was your range of income during that time? We started at about 103000 a year, and now we're at 176 Way to go, guys. Wow. What do y'all do for a living? I'm a teacher. Mm-hmm. And I, and I work for a Bay Area Transit Authority. Okay. Very cool. What, what, what grade do you teach, Michelle? I teach first grade, those little guys. I love it. Good for you. Wow. Very and cool. I think I'm a superstar today because I'm going to be on the radio. Well, you, you are a superstar. Yes. You paid off 120000 bucks. That qualifies. Yeah. All right. Tell us the story. What happened four years and two months ago put you on this journey? Well, we had dabbled a little bit in some envelopes because we had heard CDs. A friend lent us uh, several years ago. Um, but we didn't get real serious until our church had a Financial Peace University class. And we sat down and really started, the, one of the first things you do is tally up how much you're in debt. And it was kind of shocking. <laughs> Scared the crud out of you, huh? Yeah, it did, because we're older and we need, I couldn't see myself at 80 years old with student loans still, Ugh. you know. So <laughs> we were in an all-fired hurry to get it done at that point. Right. Yeah. So, so you went through the class, really and that started. got you going hardcore. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Way to go. We got real guys. serious. We kept the envelopes religiously. We named every penny. I mean, we sold stuff. We rolled change. And we took lots of walks and hikes, ate sandwiches in the parks. Um, Sound like you were healthier. Right. Yes. <laughs> 
That too. Wow. Good for you. Well done, you guys. So, Thanks. Jeffrey Michelle, so it sounds like you guys went all in pretty quickly on this. Were there some hiccups or were there some things that were really, really hard as you began this process of gazelle intensity? Yeah. Yes. Tell me yeah. about it. Well, it was just, like I said, we just really worked hard at making sure that we, you know, followed the steps and make sure that – it really was interesting was the fact that – um. Um, we, some of the challenges were, you know, I, I had our time sticking to the changes and some of us wanted to do, you know, she had our time with, you know, paying the smallest interest first in the baby steps and stuff. And then, but I, I, I found in the last year or two, especially as we were getting, it was fun. Once we paid off a debt, it was like, uh, hi, well, okay, we want to get to the next one. You <laughs> yeah. know, and so that seemed to be the big kicker is, you know, well, right, what's the next one and how fast can we get it and it off? That seemed to be. The fun that became our entertainment was okay. Let's knock out the first one as fast as possible. Right, that worked, Dave. I'll tell you, Dave and Ken. Um, for me, it was really hard because I was used to being taught you pay the high interest things first, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and it was a total change. To and I consider to, it a a personal. Um, championship moment that i convinced a first grade teacher to do something because first grade teachers are hardcore man i mean you guys have a system you stick to it if i got you to do it i can get anybody to do it that's awesome you got it you got it but then getting me to pay those small ones first yeah not the high interest it was a change of thinking and it, I finally, it took a while for me to wrap my head around it but i did it yeah and, and then it. and then when they started going away you started going oh yeah yeah that snowball gets really exciting <laughs> I love it. Yes. <laughs> I'm so proud of you guys. What do you tell Thank people you. the key to getting out of debt is? Persi- just being patient. Being patient and kind for you, kind to yourself. Hmm. Forgiving yourself and jumping back on. Yeah. That sounds like you fell off. Um, not really. We'd have a month or two where we get a, got a little slippery, but no, it's okay. It's tight okay. enough. We're getting a little sloppy here, okay. you know, um, instead of letting it carry us away, we Good. just kind of had to Yeah, because you do, when you slip like that, you either finish falling off or you grab a hold and pull back up, right? Right. Yes. That's more of what we did. We were like, okay, uh-oh, we're, we're, we're pulling out this, we're doing this uh, thing wrong here. Let's get back on the horse and get back to where we are supposed to be. <laughs> and we said a lot of this. What would Dave say? Exactly. Mm. We did a lot of that. <laughs> My shaming voice in your head. Yeah. <laughs> I love her laugh. I wish everybody responded to what would Dave say with that laugh. It doesn't usually have that much harmony and, and melody and happiness. Usually people curse his name. You're just like hilarious. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are amazing. We're so proud of you. Hey, we got a copy of the uh, uh, Maybe Steps Millionaires for you because that's the next chapter in your story for sure. You're on your way to doing that. Uh, very well done. Everybody at Ramsey congratulates you. We will send you a high five from Nashville. We'll also send Yay. you a copy of Total Money Makeover. You can give it to someone and get their journey started like yeah. you have, uh, like it has for 8 million plus people now in these days. So way to go, you guys. Very, very, very proud Thank of you. you. So Thank much. you so much. All right, Jeffrey and Michelle, Oakland, California. A first grade teacher did it. 120000 paid off in four years and two months, making 103 to 176 Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. One, One two, two, three. three. We're debt-free. So, Coleman, the Babylon Bee has gotten in a lot of trouble in a couple of instances with their satire. Oh, yes. People, uh, cancel culture has been jumping on them. We've been following the Babylon Bee since before it was a thing. Um, It was just a thing making fun of a a bunch of Christians making fun of a bunch of Christians. It was hilarious stuff. And it has now expanded a little bit. So, since they began, I mean, like their first, I don't know, five or six satirical articles. One of them was aimed at me. Oh, yeah. And they are funny. Very funny. They're fun. They rip Dave Ramsey to shreds, and it is funny. 
they're not mean mean about it. They're mean about some people, but they're not really mean to me. Well, they're not. Yeah, they don't rip you to shreds. They're playing. All, everything is they're, satire. But they're just making fun of. Them. It's so funny though. They're, yeah. So they they posted one last week, and my guys brought it to me a while ago. Dave Ramsey stars in new show to catch a borrower. Oh, it's called To Catch a Borrower, yeah. where he catches Christians trying to buy things on a credit card. And it's got a picture of me peeking up from behind the couch while the guy's on his computer buying stuff. Yeah. Oh, too funny. Play off of To Catch a Predator, I guess. Yeah, and it says I'm. I call the guy a freaking idiot. <laughs> Have I done that? Oh, that sounds familiar. That would be funny to see you pop up in people's living rooms. Oh, that, that could that cause not, some blood pressure issues, that for would, sure. That could cause you to get shot. <laughs> Just popping up randomly in someone's living room? That sounds is, like a good way to die. That's the concept. Yeah. So way to go, Babylon B. We salute you. That's funny. We love you guys. Keep it up. Keep making fun of everybody, including yourself. It's awesome. Everybody needs to lighten up a notch. This is The Ramsey Show. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Cody is with us in Indiana. Hi, Cody. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Um, uh, kind of nervous, not going to lie. No, no trouble. <laughs> We've never lost a patient. You're going to make it. <laughs> um. So I'm a general contractor, uh, debt free. Uh, me and my wife got about one hundred and four thousand dollars of capital, and I hate people, so I really want to work for myself rather than a client. <laughs> and uh, so my long term goal has been wanting to get into flipping houses. That way I can just flip them, sell them, be done. I ain't got to mess with anybody. But I've not gotten into it yet, and with everything going on the way it is, I'm kind of a worried about starting at the moment uh-huh. okay right. I, I gotta ask dave how are you going to be a general contractor my father-in-law is very successful at it and not deal with some people i get your general uh idea you mean you here. don't want to deal with clients nitpicking your work no I, well that always happens <laughs> yeah. regardless yeah. Uh, you can work for 100 different people 90 of them is great 10 of them are not so great Right, that's about um, average. Yeah, I, it's just uh, being the owner. I'm constantly running to the running to the stores all the time, and I just want to be able to work if, myself. You're going to do all the work yourself, or are you going to sub it out? Uh, I'd sub out what I could. I mean, I don't want to cut in my costs, of course, but. I don't do everything. I don't do HVAC. I'm not licensed for that, of course. Okay. Um, so what about, I, I'm with Ken. I don't mind answering your question, but I'm just curious because I, I, there's times I agree with you. I, I love people, but they also, about 2% of them should be institutionalized. So, um, yeah. you know, they just, they're, they're nutty and they're on Twitter. And so um, what, what, what is it, uh, what people are you cutting out by doing this process? Well, uh, client, I don't have to go uh, do bids for people and then do their work. I can just, Hundred percent work for myself. Okay. I, right. I and until you house. sell the house, and they're of course going to want you to do, uh, to to finish up or, or to to uh, fix whatever is broken after they move in, right? You know that. Unfortunately. Yeah. But, that's that's going to go. So you're not cutting them out completely, but you're getting rid of a lot of the back and forth while you're doing the job. That's what you're after. Yes. I'm, okay. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Right. Now let's go back to your question. Flipping houses. Well, we're in a white hot real estate market. Everybody knows that, right? So very tough to yeah. buy deals. And part of flipping a house and making money is you have to buy it at a deal. Agreed? Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. 
And so what you've got to be very, very careful of is, A, no debt, B, Mm -hmm. be so patient that you pass on 50 deals to get one that works. Okay? Mm -hmm. I I used to buy, before I went broke, I made a really good living and, and buying and selling foreclosures. I was doing flips before Chip and Joanna were born. Okay? And so, um... I, but I looked at, in those days, I looked at 200 deals to buy one. That was my average. Because I was going to, because all the money in real estate on flips is made at the buy. If you mm-hmm. buy a property and the weird, crazy, white hot market where people are paying too much is the only way you get out of it and make money, you didn't buy the property right. Yes. You need to buy it at 70, 72, 73% of appraisal today minus repairs yes and then you can actually make a profit because you're going to lose 12 percent on the resale in commissions closing costs and negotiation off of appraisal unless you catch the edge of a white hot market which we're in right now okay but if you depend on a white hot market to bail out your bad deal you're going to get your butt burned yeah that's what i don't want to happen yeah so (laughs) buy cheap or don't buy and buy with debt and have a formula minus repairs. So, uh, you know, you got a, let's use a round number. You got a hundred thousand dollar house. You're going to buy it for seventy two, seventy three thousand dollars. It means ten thousand dollars worth of repairs means you're going to buy it for sixty two thousand. How are you going to find that in this world today? You might find it because it might be so messed up. Nobody else wants it because it's so freaking ugly that even a white hot market won't sell this white elephant. Okay. But they're very hard. Deals are hard to find right now. And foreclosures are not happening at the level that they were happening because there's been a whole bunch of people still sitting on the foreclosures due to the moratoriums. They're just starting to reenter the market. So a little harder to find the foreclosure deals, too, uh, right now. Okay. Maybe by the end of summer, they will have opened back up. So if you're patient and you just say, you know, don't, don't get all hot and bothered about buying something, and you buy it at a deal minus repairs, and you get paid to do the repairs, and then you get paid on the transaction as a profit, both things, Then, and you do it with no debt, then you're going to be okay. So, um, But that's going to involve a lot of work of finding a deal, and it's very difficult to do right now. Uh, and there's people out there flipping houses right now, and they're depending on white hot market to bail them out and that market's going to turn off on them and they're going to get caught holding that so cody dave just gave you the formula so now you have to ask the question how much money must i have so what needs to be true do i need two hundred thousand in cash 250 to be able to get that kind of a deal with that ratio and then make money on it because remember you're making really good money in your business right now i suspect yeah and so if you're going to switch over to full-time flipper then you got to play that equation out how many houses would i have to flip to pay myself what i make you've given him a wonderful formula now he's going to have to be patient that's yeah, what's going to be 104,000 to invest in flipping that um three times a year maybe um you're probably building some houses still yeah that's while right. you're it's going to take flips. some time while you're running these flips you yeah. could run both at the same time but having until you build your capital up and you could get two or three flips going at a time that's correct with actual dollars then when you get there you could probably step aside from doing the contracting but you're probably still going to do a little contracting and that'll also calm you down and you don't get desperate. Oh, I got to get a house because I got to get income, and then that's going to cause you to pay too much. Uh, the the name of the game in this is a patience. Yes. You know, I had a guy at a, a mortgage company I used to buy a property from after they took it back. One of these little finance companies, and he goes, Ramsey, you're a vulture. You're the nicest vulture I know, <laughs> but you're a vulture. And I said, Well, you're right. I'm kind of circling, waiting on something to die. You know, that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm because I'm looking for a deal. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not causing anybody any harm. I'm just going to help out when they're yeah. there, and I write a check and buy the property. But that was a long time ago. It was kind of a nice compliment in a way. It know. was in there. It's in there somewhere. That yeah. Dave Ramsey looking for that real estate roadkill. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the new book. Real estate roadkill. Real road estate roadkill. There it Who is, knew? folks. Who right. I was looking for a title, Ken. Dave, now this is I what write I a do. Book. This is what I do. But you know, it's funny. You know, you, you you gave you gave Cody some great advice. I love that formula. And then you said it's all about patience. In Cody's world, he needs some patience with all those people he hates. <laughs> just for a no, three I, to I, five listen. year. Pro- I get what he's saying though. He's he's working with clients that are just nitpicking and driving him bananas. We uh, 
yeah, I, I was in the custom home building business as a sales guy for a while. And he's right. You know, about nine out of 10 of them are just the greatest people in the world. But let me tell you who drives you absolutely nuts. The ones that are too broke to buy it. Ah, right. So now they, they're trying. And, to- and, and so they're trying to flex up. <laughs> You know, and they go through the house and they nitpick stuff that right. doesn't even like Scrippin's going to fix their like, problem. Like you know, like you know, it's, <laughs> you're still going to be broke after you flex <laughs> over this drywall piece of drywall right here. You know, that's so, classic. Yeah, you know, one guy went through with a magic marker, and he had the plan wrong in his hand. He had it backward, and he drew on the wall where the plugs were supposed to be instead of where they were. Oh boy! Yeah, we charged him like ten thousand dollars to go through. We had to sand and seal. And then repaint every one of those walls and cover that stupid magic marker that this person. So I get it. I get it. I get it. I understand. I mean, it, that guy, the magic marker guy, that'll drive you out of the business right yeah, there. Yeah, it would. And so, um, yeah, you've got to manage those people and manage their expectations in the process. And it's um, it's a challenge in that world. It really is. So, uh, yeah. Because people start building their dream home, and by the time it's done, their dream changed. Mm. Yeah. Who knew? It's my forever home until it's not forever because nothing's forever ball this is the ramsey show Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts. about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where dad is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. As we talk about your jobs, we talk about your career, we talk about your money, we talk about your relationships, your mental wellness, your life is discussed every day here on The Ramsey Show. The phone number is 888-825-5225. One of the things we have taught you since we began around here was a a takeoff of the scripture in Hebrews. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it yields a harvest of righteousness. Now, the way we've been saying that around here is if you live like no one else, later you can live and give like no one else. You have to pay a price to win. No discipline is pleasant at the time. You have to pay a price to win. But then when you go win and you're outrageously generous, now you're really, really, really winning. And that's how it works. However, Ken, are you aware that in our culture today Mm. that rich people are greedy? Horrible people. Rich people are awful. Mm Mm-hmm. If you build wealth, you are a horrible human being. Yes. Even if you're generous with it, you prove that you're a hypocrite. Yes. You are awful. You must. The only way to build wealth is to screw people over. Yes. On the backs of Absolute, the less fortunate. You have to. You have, and always poor people. Always, you need to screw oh, yeah. poor people because they have more money for you to get. That's Wait a minute. I'm now confused. But <laughs> yeah, you you have to make all your money on the backs of poor people and you're greedy rich people. Greedy rich people. They don't pay enough people. in taxes. They got to pay it's, their it's, fair it's share. It's unfair. The greedy right. rich people are everywhere. So James, our producer, came up with the idea that we need to do a greedy rich people segment and periodically expose these greedy, horrible rich people segment. Today we're going to pick on a superstar. Yes. In the NBA. Yeah. Uh, Bismack Biombo. Yeah. And I'm not an NBA guy, obviously, because I hesitated pronouncing that. Don't tell me just, Dave Ramsey doesn't prepare. Let's you not should an just easy know that. To say. You should just know that I spe- – yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, Bismack uh, apparently is one of these gritty rich people because yeah. according to this article on CNN, uh, he donated his entire salary from the NBA to build a hospital mm-hmm. in his native Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. 
and honor his late father. The Phoenix Suns star, the 29-year-old, returned to the NBA in January, signing a contract for the duration of the season, and he donated the entire amount, $1.3 million, to build a hospital in his home country. And he, uh, he donned the 18 jersey for the Suns in honor of his father's June 18th birthday. His father passed away, and he's donating the entire amount uh, to be named after Francis. Uh, would cons- uh, consolidate his legacy whilst helping those in need back home. I told my agent my salary for this year will be going to the construction of a hospital back home to give hope to the hopeless at home and those individuals that cannot take their family members out, Biombo said. Greedy rich guy. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Dave, that $1.3 million donation of a salary for the hospital is in addition to the almost a million dollars worth of medical equipment that his foundation uh, sent over to the Democratic Republic of Congo in the earliest of 2020. That's what greedy rich people do. They usually double dip like that. So, yeah. If you're going to be greedy and rich, you should do it twice. Well, they have a pattern of their greed. Yes. This is clearly a pattern. Out of control generosity by these greedy rich people. (laughs) It needs to stop. You're giving back bad name to the greedy rich people when you're generous like this it you need to stop yeah now here's what i'll also say about how can that fit with the narrative that's (laughs) out there well because here's what i mean well it it can't he's messing it It up can't he's messing up the narrative but this is the rare situation dave you know this um i'm not very wealthy at all but i do know a lot of wealthy people and here's what i know they don't normally talk about their charity and their donation this is a story because he's in the NBA. But most rich people, you don't even know how much they're giving. You don't even know where their fingerprints are because it turns out these awful, greedy rich people don't need credit either. Oh, they weren't doing. They weren't taking a poll. It wasn't optics. Yeah, no, they just do it. Oh, kind of like COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't about optics. It wasn't about the way it looked. It was mm. the way it actually is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that. I can't tell you how many rich people that I've heard of and known that that uh, paid for supplies and private planes in different countries all around the world. You never even see it on CNN, but it's you, happening. You won't. You you, you, you won't, won't see it because you won't find out about it, and it That's won't right. be reported. I'm glad he reported this because it exposed the greedy rich people for what they really are. <laughs> yes. And I'm glad we have a news story. I'm glad CNN did their investigative journalism and yes. discovered that this guy is yet another of those horrible, successful people who uh, are the best at their craft in the world mm-hmm. and uh, chose to give the money away and um, build a hospital. I think it's just horrible. It's just awful. Yeah. I can't believe people really do stuff like that. Yeah, but, this new generation of... And NBA worse than players. that, yeah, he even talked about it yeah. and inspired <laughs> other people to be greedy rich people. Yeah, <laughs> It's just horrible. I can't believe it. What a horrible, awful... You know, Charles Barkley did the same thing. We, we oh, featured yeah. him on the greedy rich people. We featured Dolly Parton on the greedy rich people. Oh, There's yeah. a, the She's famous, one of the You know, worst. we should change it to the famous... It was Shaq? Was it Shaq? Yeah, it was Shaq. Shaq. It yeah. wasn't Barkley. I'm sure Barkley's a greedy rich guy, too. Yeah, yeah. He's pretty much known yeah. for his, you know, his donut. Oh, I mean, yeah. people. Listen. Don't get me started on Dolly Parton, who's clearly oh, one of the most sh- evil people to walk the face oh, of it's the just, earth. She's awful. She's awful. I mean, she just gives and gives and gives and gives and gives and gives all over Tennessee, but particularly East Tennessee, her homeland. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the level of generosity, the things she does for the workers at Dollywood, the things she did for the people at Gatlinburg during the during the fires, the money that was spent. All, all kids in Tennessee get free books to read, by the way, and it's all Dolly's fault because she's a gritty rich lady. And so they just, it's unbelievable yeah. what these people do. It's horrible. It's awful. They're giving a bad name to rich people. Yeah. It's messing up the uh, messing up the lefty n- narrative. There it is. See that narrative exists, folks, because it's all about politics and the tax rate. So if we can make the rich people look evil, then we can tax oh. them more for government programs. There's the rest of the story. If is you want to that simplify, how it works. Yeah, pretty simple formula. Because government good. Rich people bad. Well, yes, the government knows That's what to do with how the money. This works. Now, Why trust rich people? And they're people? more efficient. Yeah, they're then more efficient people. at losing the money. Yeah. yeah. Then the actual people who, by the way, created an unbelievable product or made millions and, by the way, hired thousands and paid them tens of millions of dollars. But the government can do better than the actual successful rich people. That's this right. is the so moral of the story. if you were really <laughs> generous, you would pay a higher tax bill. And let Uncle Sam figure out how to distribute it. Because he's, cause he's, he's um, Uncle, wiser. Uncle Sam is wise mm-hmm. and efficient. Yeah. 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 
Is the sarcasm font on? I, think, I, I, I hope we made it obvious that uh, we're being sarcastic. For, for new listeners, don't... don't if uh, the subtitles are not in the sarcasm font, yeah. we're in trouble now. Yeah. You know, we yeah. just lost all of our entire tribe. But, yeah. but this is really turning into something far more serious, Dave, and it's class warfare, and it's a dangerous thing. You know, because you forget no, it's who worse, makes it's the worse job. than class warfare. It's a, it's a war on success. Yeah, because the upper class in the United States did not become that way by aristocracy or by inheritance. That's correct. They earned it. That's right. And they earned it through successful living and saving and serving, and this guy earned it. Well, no basketball player. Well, then don't go to an NBA game and pay them if you don't believe that. But if you're going to go over there and pay the ticket price, then shut up about what they get paid, because you paid it. This is The Ramsey Show. On baby step number one, eh? How'd you guess? With health care costs rising, learn how Christian Healthcare Ministries can help you make the most out of your budget. Visit chministries.org slash budget. Don't worry, it's worth it. No time's important. It's even more precious than money or shiny toys or winning certificates at work. And like spending money from an account when you don't know how much is in it, we never know how much time we really have. So if you could do one thing that would make the time you have even more worthwhile, you'd do it, wouldn't you? Of course you would. We get that. And we want you to have everything you need to be well. And that's why we're partnering with BetterHelp to give you a month of free one-on-one weekly therapy when you pre-order a copy of Dr. John Deloney's new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Who does that? Well, I better help and Ramsey. That's who. You're never too old or too young to improve your health and make your relationship stronger. Your free month of one-on-one therapy that is weekly will give you the tools you need to change your future because you'll get matched up with a therapist based on your specific needs. It's a life-changing combo. The new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future, comes out next week. It'll make you laugh. It'll make you cry. It did me. It will challenge you. It did me. And when you take the first steps the Dr. Deloney outlines to take advantage of your free therapy, you'll also be transformed. It's amazing. All of this for 20 bucks if you pre-order. Now, the book is next Tuesday, a week from Tuesday. It's here. And all the special deals and the free ebook and the free audio book and the Better Help Therapy Sessions all go away. If you don't pre-order the book for $20, it's all included for $20 at RamseySolutions.com. Own your past, change your future. The book will change your life. It's incredible. I'm so excited about it. The pre-sales are off the chain. This guy is white hot. His show is exploding, and he it's abs- he's doing an absolutely amazing job. We're so, so proud of him. And with two PhDs, that means he's got two more than you and me put together. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. (laughs) I can't even spell PhD. We're still working on that. I got a PhD in D-U-M-B. All right. There we go. (laughs) Hey, James is in Philadelphia. Hey, James, what's up? Hey, Dave. How's everything going? Better than I deserve. How can I help? Good, good. So, Dave, I'm a current third-year podiatric medical student. My wife and I, we're currently debt-free. And we have enough money to save for, or we have enough money saved that we can pay for the rest of my tuition. But now with the current politics and the environment that's going on with the student loans and what's going on with the federal government, we're now considering taking out a loan for almost 50K student loan and then using that money to invest, especially since there's zero interest on federal student loans. We would do that with the option to pay that right away off once the interest starts to accrue. Mm-hmm. And then once student debt forgiveness is officially off the table, 
Do you think this is a smart decision in your eyes? So you're doing this in the hope that you don't have to repay it? Not necessarily. More or less, we would invest it while there is 0% interest accruing. Mm -hmm. But if the off chance that student debt does get forgiven, Mm -hmm. we would basically just, I mean, save our back then because we would be a little bit disappointed if student loans were forgiven when we paid out of pocket all this time. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, a cu- couple of breakdowns in that um, where you and I are not aligned, and um, I'll walk through those with you because you called and asked us, okay? Mm-hmm. So the, the first thing is is um, I, I'm not aligned that we take out student loans with the hope that they are forgiven uh, because to me that's like, taking money you weren't supposed to take because you didn't need it and it's kind of like i don't know that that feels like stealing to me okay Mm -hmm. i'll just say it out loud and um the second thing is borrowing money to invest at a greater interest rate than the money is costing you has not proven to be something we found in the data that causes people to become wealthy so Mm -hmm. borrowing money to invest is not the normative way. It's statistically unusual as a way to build wealth. What I mean is, when we studied 10,167 millionaires, the number of millionaires that borrowed money to invest, called arbitrage or playing margin, or anytime you're borrowing money to invest, you could borrow money to buy real estate, uh, you're borrowing mm-hmm. money to invest, hoping that the investment is going to create a greater rate of return than the money costs you when you borrow it. The number of people that built wealth doing that was way less than 5%, meaning that 96, 97% of the millionaires we interviewed did not use this process to become millionaires. Now, if I told you as a procedure in medical school that you had a 97% failure rate, you would avoid that procedure. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because the data tells you that. The facts tell you that this methodology is not successful but 3 or 4% of the time. Um, and so you would avoid that methodology. And so I'm going to tell you not to borrow money. And so what I'm saying is what sounds smart on the surface has not proven out to be the typical way people build wealth because what you're leaving out of the equation is the risk situation. And you're adding stress. You're adding uh, risk. Anytime you borrow money, you add risk. The more money you borrow, the more risk you have. And that enters into the factor. It enters into relationships. It enters into uh, mental wellness. It en- enters into the uh, stress across the back of your neck. Uh, it enters into the stress around your heart. Um, it enters into the job you take because you're in debt or not in debt. I understand you have the money in the bank to pay it off. So your level of risk is relatively low compared to someone that's playing you know, borrowing the money and going to Vegas and has a problem, right? I understand you're not doing that. I get that. And, and so I see the logic in, in how you got there. But um, I'm just telling you the procedure that you're using is not used normatively by people who get the result that you're looking for. I would also say that the logic is based on a hope and a wish. And I think it's just simply that. When I was growing up, Dave, you'll remember, I'm 47, so all the 40-somethings will remember this crazy giant chicken named foghorn leghorn he used to terrorize the bulldog in in that cartoon he would put a stake on the end of a fishing pole and he'd hold it out in front of that bulldog and make that bulldog just chase that stake you, chase you, that you stake. didn't know huh you didn't know that he's been canceled oh he has yeah the bulldog union oh is that right i didn't rose know up this and- you're, oh, yeah, I thought you were serious it. for a second. I was like, did I really miss that? Because anything's possible. <laughs> you just killed my metaphor. Here's the deal. Biden and the Democrats are dangling this policy out there. Yeah. And I'm just going to tell you, this isn't a political statement. Some of you will call it that. You can get over it later. But I'm <laughs> telling you that they are dangling that as a possibility to garner votes. They have been in power before. They're they in power have, right now. They what have they, they done? Right what have they done? To, you know, and they've they got, never they got Congress. They got the Senate. They got the president. They're not going to do it. Here's why. Until until October, they got all three. Yeah. If you want to pass a law, right now is the time to pass it. But they never have, and they never will. Here's why. You go do the research yourself, folks. That's big money. Sally Mae, Freddie Mae. It is big money for the federal government. It has been since they started the student loan program way back in the late '50s, early '60s, and replaced the Pell Grant. This is a big money play for the government. They're not going to forgive student loans ever 
And I just think that if that wasn't a potential, you know, kind of a, a stake out there dangling in front of people, uh, then they wouldn't be thinking about this. And I just got to tell you, I don't, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news. They're not going to do it. They've had chances before. This is not a new idea. This is not a new concept. This is recycled political jargon. And uh, I, I wouldn't trust it for a second. Yeah. Well, even if they do. It's still not right to your point. Even if they do. I agree with that. St- I agree. I'm borrowing money so like that the government, the government gives yeah. it, a, you know, it's like saying, that's like uh, saying I'm unemployed when I'm not yeah. so that I get unemployment or like saying I'm broke. So I, t- I get my welfare check, even though I'm making money on the table. Uh, all of those are theft. All of those are morally wrong. And um, so I wouldn't do it for those reasons. But thank you for the call and appreciate the discussion. It's very, very good. Um, I'll add one thing to this whole discussion, because it sounds like we're somehow kind of uh, self-righteous NIMS or something. But again, data. Okay, The guy who wrote uh, Millionaire Next Door, Tom Stanley, was a friend of mine before he passed away. He wrote the book in 1992. He wrote a follow-up book later of on DECA millionaires, people that had $10 million or more. He studied 38 characteristics. He was a statistician. That was his background, a marketing guy. And he studied 38 characteristics of the people that became decamillionaires. The most correlated of the different variables, married, race, profession, whatever, character qualities, the most correlated of all the 38 in all the decamillionaires, number one indicator you're going to be a decamillionaire was outlandish fanatical levels of integrity. You don't get that one very often. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit. Whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com. personality is my co-host today cameron's in grand rapids michigan hey cameron welcome to the ramsey show hi how are you guys doing today great man what's up uh so i have a question i have a uh a job opportunity that's gonna help me make uh, about double what i make right now uh but it's a traveling job what do you make so now I have to buy uh about 55 okay so you make 110 if you travel yep uh, it's a traveling job so I would be looking to buy a uh, RV, uh, and I don't have all the money to buy it, so I'd have to get a loan. Why do you have to have an RV? Uh, to stay in while I'm there. Why don't you just run a hotel? Uh, I wanted to bring my my dogs with me, my girlfriend. Okay. Was that a statement or a question? It sounded like a statement, uh, or is there a question in there? No, a statement. Yeah, I'd like to bring my dogs and my girlfriend with me. Okay. <laughs> Again, you just made a statement, so that's it's your life. You can do whatever you want. But going, well, into- I was just wondering if it was a good uh, a good idea to take the new job and make the extra money. It is, but it's not uh, a good idea to take an R- buy an RV on debt. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes to you the You know job. how fast cars go down in value? RVs are yeah. worse. Right. They're a black hole for money. 
You want to know how to you know how, how to have a, a small fortune? Start with a large fortune and buy RVs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to end up looking like that thing in Christmas Vacation anyway. Yeah, don't be cousin Eddie. No. Yeah. Um, the <laughs> so yeah, I, I I think you probably do this and you pay cash for a nice used RV after you've been on the road six months in uh, temporary housing. Okay. Now, are you in, in one location at a time, or are you in different locations yeah. every week? Or Yeah, it'd be like a, a six-month commitment to one place, and mm-hmm. then uh, I'd move on from there. Oh, okay. So you could, like, rent a property that allowed dogs? Oh, yeah, I, I could do that as well. Yeah. I didn't think about that. The, oh. the places are super rural, so I didn't know if there were going to be any there, but I can check. Pretty Pretty likely they'll allow dogs then. Yeah. And there's somebody yep. renting something in the rural areas, too. And so you, you don't even have to necessarily do a hotel. You might find a great room over a garage. You know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do this and bank most of this new money. What's your uh, girlfriend do for a living? Uh, she's a manager at a uh, grocery store. So she's going to do that remote? Uh, no, she'd come with me and then uh, she'd do school full time. Go to school. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. And so she's not going to be making any money. Uh, most likely no. Okay. All right. Um. I I think for the first uh, year to two years of this experiment, I would rent a home in each location. And make sure that this is a stick. If you're going to keep doing this for a five or a ten year period, the RV might make sense. Otherwise, the uh, the loss in value of the RV is going to make you wish you had paid rent. If you add up how much the RV is going down in value, it will be the equivalent of renting a fairly nice place, depending on how nice an RV you buy, of course. But the nicer RV you would buy, the more the nicer rental property you would compare it to. And so. Um, you know, they just they just don't do well on values. And so I'm afraid you're going to get stuck. And here's what's happened. Uh, you got this job offer, and now you've romanticized the traveling part of it in your head um, versus the actual work part of it. And so the, the math on taking the job and doubling your income, that all works. Uh, but then you then you went off the reservation over here because you're trying to get fun and fritzy and we're going to turn this into an adventure. And, uh, no, you're just going to turn it into cousin Eddie. Don't do it. Um, no, I, I would, I would, I would rent a house. If I were in your shoes and I woke up, I'd probably go on the adventure, but I'd rent the house and I would, um, if I'm going to keep doing this long term, I would buy a used RV with cash that I save up because I make twice as much as I used to make. I got a question for you, Dave, and I'm, this is not a suggestion. I don't want anybody to think I'm making the suggestion, but I am curious. What do you think about the tiny house that you can pull on wheels? I just haven't done any research. I understand the RVs devalue. What do you think about the tiny house on wheels? There's, Same no, there's, no, there's no resale value. Right. Yeah. And but so, it's a whole lot less money. Yeah, but it's no resale value. Again, so again, it's consumption. Gotcha. So I, I would I just you. go with yeah. something. I agree. If you don't have to own something Uh in order to make this happen let's not own something i agree because it could be a temporary decision that way yeah and it increases the quality of the adventure yep not venture adventure Uh minnesota is on the line and that's lee calling hi lee how are you hi thanks for taking my call guys sure what's up um, we were wondering, my husband and I, um, your thoughts on potentially buying a house right now. We have started the process um, about two years ago to build a house. Um, we have the land, but with the materials costs and everything kind of going a little haywire over the past couple of years, we're thinking we might not be building as soon as we would have liked. Um, we had heard about a house that's coming up for sale in a couple of days, um, I'm wondering your guys' thoughts, like, is it still worth it to potentially buy a house if we hope to sell it and build in the next, like, five to six years? Yes. Okay. Okay. And, let's let's, let's, let's think about this sell, for a second. Okay? High, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's think about this for a second. How old are you guys? Um, 30. Okay. So can you remember when you were 25? Yeah. Remember what houses <laughs> have done since you were 25 until you were 30? Increasing value would have been a good move, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yep. 
That's okay. how that's how I did that. Mm-hmm. Okay. So even though like it's kind of going haywire right now, that you don't anticipate it's, it. Like, I have no idea. I mean, there's no no one knows okay. what's going to happen uh, for that's sure. True. But uh, I am investing in real estate as we speak. I believe in real okay. estate. I I don't. It may it may it may have a little bit of a cycle. It may turn back down, but long sure. term it'll turn up and you'll be fine. And it would be a very unusual five to seven year period of time that the house didn't go up in value. Enough that you make money on it when you resell it, even after expenses. It'd be a very unusual. It doesn't have to be white hot for this to work. It just has to be a normal market. And if you did it in the last five years, you, w- you would have participated in one of the hottest real estate markets in history. So it would have been highly unusual in the last five years that you didn't make money. But um, you can't count on that as being the future. But if you count it on just a normal real estate rhythm, that's a long enough time horizon that you're going to be just fine. And I, I'm kind of with you. I like the idea of waiting a little while and letting, because I do think the building materials and the labor force is going to uh, come back down to normal. Mm-hmm. I think it's out of control, but that's a supply-demand thing where housing prices, also a supply-demand thing, but there's a little likelihood it's going to catch up as much as the building materials catch up. So we get past the COVID dip on the lumber yards not having any lumber, and then all of a sudden they had lumber again, and it was double. And uh, it takes a little while for that to smooth out, that wrinkle in the economy to smooth out. And that's what's caused some of our inflation, is the results of the factories being shut down during quarantine, therefore creating a shortage. And anytime there's a shortage, you see price increase. That's pretty simple. And pretty simple, it's seventh grade econ. Okay, so good question. Appreciate you calling in. Open phones at 888-825-5225. I'll tell you what I did not seek in. I had no clue that today, two years, it's basically two years since the peak of COVID right now. The quarantines all started about two years ago right now. Um, and that two years later, we'd still be seeing economic effects from this. Yeah. Um, I don't think many people did. I honestly thought it was going to be a very short-lived thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the the results, the economic impact of the quarantines... Um, the flattening of the curve, uh, the e- economic suppression by government, uh, the the world that a lot of people are living in that is not a good world right now is a result of that still two years later. You can't blame all that on Biden. That was on a quarantine that did that. That's right. This is The Ramsey Show. Coleman Ramsey personality is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your life here on the Ramsey show Calvin's with us in Raleigh North Carolina hi Calvin how are you hi Dave I'm very honored and uh, extremely grateful to be speaking with you today and your ministry has um, literally changed my life so thank you for that well thank you Um, we're honored thank you my question today is um, I need advice on a plan so um I want to, uh, I'm calling it semi-retire, but um, I, I'm, I'm not passionate about a 30-year career that I um, a- am wanting to end. And what my question is, should I make a career change at my age that will probably reduce my income dramatically, and it may even go to zero, while I'm contracting a house? And um, what I want to do is be a builder owner. I, uh, sorry, yeah, build my own house. And also, I want to begin a um, a process of becoming a financial coach. So I, I, I like to give you a little bit of background. I've been with the same company 30 years, and as I said, I'm not very passionate about it anymore. I, I feel like all I'm doing is um, showing up and 
um, making a large corporation a lot of money, which, you know, I'm very grateful for the 30 years that they've given to me, but I'm not passionate about doing it anymore. What do you make? I really like to help. I'm sorry. What do you make? Um, as far as salary Mm -hmm. or what's your income? Um, 200. Okay. And how old are you? I'm 55. Okay. And what's your net worth? Um, probably 3.6 million. Okay. And is a lot of that invested where you can live off of the income that 3.6 million creates? So some of it, I probably could, uh, about, about, um, 1.1 million is in 401ks that I obviously can't live off, um, for my age. Right. Um, but another million is, um, well, another one, yeah, 1 million probably to 1.4 million is in either cash or, um, or investment accounts. Okay. And another factor is my wife, um, will still be working while I do this, and she makes approximately 130 Okay. And your goal is to build a house for yourself. Correct. Okay, so that's kind of an independent variable. You're going to do that either way. Um, well, it's either that or stay employed and let a contractor build the house for me. Which oh, so you would so be you the general to- contractor on the house. Yes, sir. That's right. I see. Okay. But the business that you want to start up for the remainder of your income is you want to be a financial coach. Yes. And I, and I'm not even sure I want to charge for that. Um, I, I, I've listened to your webinar and I want to probably sign up for your master financial coach, Mm -hmm. um, curriculum. Um, but I'm not sure if I'm ready to charge people for that or, Um, just do that as you know a free thing for people who need assistance. What do you do now? The position, what kind of work that you've been doing for thirty years? Uh, I manage business systems for a large corporation. Okay. Okay. You, you've earned the right, right to do whatever you want. Three point six million. You can do whatever you want to do. Okay. So okay. there's there's no uh, downside. So what you're trading out for is you're you're walking away from two hundred k for potentially mm-hmm. zero income. Uh, right. And that's the only disturbing part of it, just because it sounds like a bad use of you, not because you need the money. Um, and I wouldn't tell you to stay in the 200 k long term, but I might tell you to stay in it another year and get the business, get the coaching business up and running, because I think you'll feel better about you if you're at least earning, a, you know, half of what you used to earn. And you get mm-hmm. moving again, and because you're just a guy that moves things around. I mean, you're not, you know, no boss grows on you, dude. You're, you've been moving stuff around for a long, long time, and you just kind of mm-hmm. hit the wall emotionally on this one gig. But I, I think you'll feel better about you if this doesn't go to zero. I think that might create some kind of a backlash inside your emotions. It wouldn't mind if I went to mm-hmm. zero. What do you— Yeah. Why, why are you so uh, – what's the emotional pull to be a financial coach? What's that desired result in your words? When you coach people, to, what's that desired result? When you're done coaching somebody financially, what do you want to see people do? To put people in a position where money is not the sole focus so that they can focus their lives on – something better than just money where you are you yes right right where i mean 20 years ago i listened to your show and i i'm a nerd so i put it in a spreadsheet the the debt snowball and honestly i didn't even follow the baby steps but I, i i passed it by a friend of mine and he said that's not real life that will never happen and and in five years, I was out of debt, and from there, I've just kept going. So I want other people to feel yeah. the freedom of that. So, Calvin, here's why I ask those two quick questions. I, I, I agree with what Dave is saying. I, I don't know that you have to have this narrative in your mind that it's zero, and it's just ministry, or it's just personal. Um, with mm-hmm. the money you all make and the discipline you have, if you you know if you want to step away from this job where you've where the soul has been sucked out of you, it's just there's no juice for you. And I think that's mm-hmm. kind of creating a little bit of confusion. Uh, if you want to go build the house, you know however long it's going to take to build the house, you got 
got the cash and all that, maybe that'd be a little bit of a break. But I would really challenge you to look not just at financial coaching, but even uh, like the men and women we call smart investor pros, where you get into to true retirement investment advice as well, where you can have tremendous impact there, but also make a really good living. Uh, because at your age, I think there's just so much more impact there. But I would encourage you to not just see, well, uh, for 30 years, I've given so much to this company. And as it stands right now, I just don't feel like I, I've i got the juice. I get that. But that doesn't mean we swing all the way over here uh, and, and, and not make any money at all. Or more importantly, it's not about money for you. I think it's contribution, which is what I talk about all the time uh, on the Ken Coleman Show and what we do here at Ramsey Solutions. It relates to work. You know, work is a contribution to make the world a better place. And we can hear that in you. And I just think there's more options here. Amen. Well done, sir. Proud of you. Good work. Sharon's in Auburn, Alabama. Hi, Sharon. What's up? Hey, how you doing? Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, I'm a school. I'm a school teacher in an elementary school, and I uh, um, was planning on retiring in three years, but a little thing happened. My husband decided he didn't want to be married anymore, so oh. I'm trying to make sure that. I'm going to be on the right track financially. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have any debt. Um, I do have an emergency fund set up, and I have um, 60000 put in a account for putting down a house, mm-hmm. which is not enough in Auburn. Mm-hmm. But my question is, I'm trying to decide, should I be putting more money in my retirement and not, you know, and just keep renting, or should all my extra cash go toward a down payment for a house? I'd put it as a down payment on the house and put it on as short a term as you can, 15 years, maybe 10 years if you can, because I want to get it paid okay. off. I want to get it paid off as quick as I can, but um, and use the 60000 which probably came from the sale of the marital house, didn't it? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah, I would use that as your down payment on the next house. Buy something conservative and get it paid off as soon as you can while you're funding retirement. And that's what we call baby steps four, five, and six. You're putting 15% of your income away for retirement, and any extra money you can find beyond that, you're paying on the house and get the house paid off. I'd love for you to have a paid-for house and a juicy nest egg when you get to those retired retirement years. Uh, That sets you up for a lot of stability and a quality, quality retirement. Um, but for sure, you want to be in the real estate business. No question about that. Because rents aren't going anywhere but up. And you don't want to be on that cycle long term. Not a good long term cycle. Good question. Thank you for joining us. Ken Coleman, good hour. This is The Ramsey Show. Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman. Ramsey Personality is my co-host today as we answer your questions about your relationships, your mental health, your job, your career, and your money. Overall, your life, right here on The Ramsey Show. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Brian is in California. Hey, Brian, welcome to The Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Thank you for taking my call. My pleasure, sir. How can I help? Yeah, um, so I'm just going to read out this thing that I wrote here. It says, uh, I'm debt-free. I have an emergency fund. 
I have a business emergency fund as well, and I'm on baby step 3B. And I just want to know if I made the right decision. I've worked for seven years in the construct in the construction industry since the age of 18. I am now 25, making really good money in my own business. And I feel bad like I let my ex-employer down. Did I make a good decision leaving my old company? My family makes me feel bad, like I charge too much. I have many clients that are happy to pay my rate. And honestly, I charge what an average professional handyman charges in my area. So what did you used to make? Um, I made thirty dollars an hour. And then what do you? Well, okay, but so what's that equate to a year? Like uh, fifty-five thousand. Okay, so you're making sixty grand a year, and what do you make now? Now, like a hundred and twenty. Okay. So. I'm confused where the mistake might be. <laughs> yeah, it's just um, my old company uh, called me earlier today. And they want a decision, and they want to know if I'm going to come back. Because initially, I told them I was going to take a break. No, I don't have brain damage. <laughs> All right. Am I missing something, Coleman? I what I well, I don't know why your family's making you feel badly about leaving this company when you've doubled over, you've doubled your salary, and you're working for yourself. I mean, my goodness, I just don't understand. I'm not sure what's missing either, but you don't need to feel guilty or bad. I don't know if they're worried about stability, but there's this myth sometimes with our friends and family members who don't have an entrepreneurial spirit. Maybe they've never worked for a true entrepreneur. Maybe they've never done it themselves. And so they think government jobs or, well, if you work for a bigger company, it's more stable. The fact of the matter is, is that you are more stable working for you with the skill sets that you have because i got to tell you something during the pandemic what we saw are folks like you were booming with their businesses and their work so i don't know what's missing either but you need to stay working for yourself based on what i've heard so the only reason okay. you would go back to work for the other company is because your relatives say you charge too much and it's evil that you've become wealthy doing this at 25 years old or, or you would go back to work there because somehow you have some kind of misguided loyalty to a company that used to pay you less than half of what you make now. Yeah, it's more the other last part. You know, I feel yeah. like, yeah. Okay. I just no. feel like I No. There's never been anyone that worked at Ramsey that left here and made double that I suggested they should come back for half. Never. Okay. Never have I suggested that. Because I actually like the people that work here, and if they can make double somewhere else, I would like that for them. Generally okay. speaking, these days, that's not possible because we pay so dadgum much now. But in the old days when we were getting started, we didn't pay a lot, and people would leave and go make more money. And I just had to help them leave and go, with, I love you, and go make more money. That's awesome. Go do it. Uh, but I don't have to do yeah. that these days, thank God. But the, um, yeah, because, but, but you need to keep doing what you're doing. So, uh, Brian, I had a, a relative uh, several years ago that loved me deeply, and she was a very, very sweet little lady. And her husband had worked in corporate America at the same job for 38 years, and she was so thankful that he had this steady job. And every time I would see her, she would ask me when I was going to get a real job. The last time she asked me that, in that calendar year, I made more in that one year than her husband made in his entire working lifetime. But she was still waiting on me to get a real job. Yeah, I, and, I hear you. And so it was not because she was bad. She actually loved me, and she was worried about me because she was worried it was unstable and that being self-employed is unstable. And the, what you find out when you're self-employed like you are, especially with, when you're a handyman and you're probably a one- or a two-man show, you find out that you are actually the secret sauce at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you are what uh, really you can count on. And by the way, it was that way all along. Mm -hmm. It was that way all along. When that guy worked for Corporate yeah. America, that, that was my relative, who was a sweet man. He was a nice man. I'm not belittling him at all. But it was just the mathematics were humorous of her point of me getting a real job. And she just desired security uh, to the point that she misjudged where security comes from. 
And security comes from your ability to get up, leave the cave, and kill something and drag it home. And you have proven your ability to do that, young man. I'm very proud yes. of you. You should keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. I so much, Dave. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wow. God bless you. Mm. Wow. <laughs> man, I, got, I talked to a handyman the other day. Yeah. You made 300 last year. Oh, yeah. It is a stinking because you can't get nobody to show up. That's if exactly. you just show up, you can charge about it's anything you want to charge. Yeah. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's a premium service. And, you know, just and that a, young man right there, wouldn't you love to have him in your house oh, fixing stuff? Oh, I would what definitely a pay him. Sweet spirit. Pay him extra. And let's, let's, just, let's just belabor this point about the size of a company equating to stability. We've all seen large companies completely evaporate or lay off people by the thousands, okay? I mean, Peloton did it recently. They were the hottest, uh, one of the hottest consumer products in, during the pandemic. Until they weren't. Until they weren't. Remember Enron? Go look that story up, a public company. So, you know, this idea that, well, I'm going to put my fortune in somebody else's hands and that's stable, well, that's just a bunch of garbage, especially when you work for yourself. You got sound financial Listen, principles. Here, here's the thing. You always... Work for yourself. When you work for a company, you just, have, you just have one client. That's right. You got one customer. Yeah. That's it. And when you work for yourself and you have a bunch of customers, it's no different. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I've got millions of customers. And uh, but when you work for a company and you're, you know, James has one customer, as far as I know. He, I'm, I, we're his only customer, Ramsey Solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's not a bad thing. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. No. But they, this idea that somehow that you're not self-employed, at the end of the day, your responsibility, your life is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And when you, acquiet, when, when you turn that responsibility over to someone else, when you d dispatch it to someone else in, in the name of security, and you say, okay, I am no longer have to worry about that because that company's going to worry about it. You just sacrifice something. So I, we tell our people around here, they're all self-employed. We say it all the time. It's one of our 14 core values. You're self-employed. You're self-employed. You're self-employed. Act like you're self-employed. Act like you own this place. Act like when you see a piece of paper on the ground, pick it up like you own the place. Be responsible. Act like you're self-employed. Act like you're self-employed. And even if you're not technically, you'll always prosper with that mentality. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're considering a career in technology, I recommend Bethel Tech, and I'm not alone. Here's what Brendan said. Before Bethel Tech, I was driving Uber. Within four months of graduating, I got a job paying $60,000. About two years after that, I got a remote job that pays me $130,000, all thanks to what I learned at Bethel Tech. You could be next. Get started today at BethelTech.net and get $1,000 to $2,500 off of your tuition. Again, it's BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. We're big fans of those of you who serve. By the way, that's almost all of you, but really those of you that serve in the military, we love you. Those of you that serve in the classroom, teachers, we're big fans of teachers here. And all year long, you've been grinding it out to make sure your students are actually learning despite all the distractions that they're dealing with right now. And you work so dad blame hard and you care even more. It's teachers like you who have taught our foundations and personal finance curriculum and have changed the lives of over 5 million students have now gone through this in high school. April is National Financial Literacy Month, and we're celebrating teachers with our teacher appreciation giveaway. Even teachers that have not even taught the class yet, our class. They just teach. If you're just a teacher, we just love teachers. We love just teachers. 
sponsored. This is a giveaway sponsored by Borrowed Future. It's our hit documentary about the dark side of the student loan industry. A teacher can enter to win. No purchase necessary today. We're going to be giving away $5,000 cash to two lucky teachers, and three teachers will each win $1,000 cash and even more. Don't miss out, teachers. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash teacher. If you know a teacher that you love, uh, be sure you tell them to go to RamseySolutions.com slash teacher and uh, get signed up because, hey, you might win 5000 bucks. Somebody does every time we do this. There's going to be two of them this time. And Financial Literacy Month, our way of celebrating teachers. If you haven't read the blog we posted, uh, that I posted uh, on my various social media channels, I didn't do the posting. I wrote the blog because um, I don't even know how to do the posting uh, on Instagram and what is it, Facebook and those other things. It's on there. So you can find it. Just me uh, celebrating all the old school teachers. I love old teachers. And some of you are Young teachers, but you've got those old teacher values, and that's the ones that, that we love. They were the ones that were tough on us and put up with us and loved us, and um, we all, every one of us credit our success to some of those old-school-type old, type, old type teachers, and uh, so check it out. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Our question of the day comes from blinds.com. We have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. They do. If you mismeasure, you pick the wrong color, they'll remake your window blinds free, and you get free samples, free shipping, and with the new promos they run every month, you'll save even more. Use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best possible deal. Today's question comes from Eric in South Dakota. Is it advisable to enroll in a certification course uh, during Baby Step 2? I'm interested in a 20-hour course, which costs $500. This certification could improve my salary expectations by more than $5,000 a year, as well as improving my resume if I were to shop the market. My company would reimburse me for the course upon completion without any explicit agreement to remain there for a specific period of time. I would just need the initial cash on hand. I know gazelle intensity means rice and beans and beans and rice, so I wanted to get your thoughts on this scenario. Well, uh, in this situation, Eric, this just seems like all upside and you're going to get reimbursed. And so I was and it's 20 hours. Yeah, yeah do it. 20 hours. Absolutely. It's no brainer. It's 20 months. We'll talk about it. Yeah. We, we teach cash. You have to cash flow things during the baby steps. And, 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 and so this is just another one of those things. So I'd do whatever I had to do, scrape, sell, whatever. I'd come up with the cash, change the budget a little bit. And uh, this is a very temporary uh, expenditure. And Bust through it. Yeah, crush it. Yeah, don't 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 hang around with this thing for two years and talk about it. Bust through it. One month. Be done in a month and get your money right back. Mm -hmm. And then it's a no no harm no foul, nope. right? That's right. And then you've got an increased income and or the potential for an increased income. I would do this as many times as you can do it. Mm -hmm. This kind of thing with certifications proves that what we tell young people all the time is the best possible investment you can make is in you. Mm -hmm. If it's a wise investment. Now, what he's done there is he has said, this is what it costs and this is what it gives back. So the net result for him is it costs zero at the end of the day. That's right. And he increases his income potential by $5,000 a year. That's kind of no brainer. Yeah, it's absolutely do it. You know, and yeah. here's the thing we're seeing today in this marketplace, more and more opportunities to what they're called upskill and, and, but be smart about it. You know, there's a lot. Anytime you see, you know, a marketplace like this where it's easier to get upskilled, you're also going to see frauds. And so my only caution would be do your homework, make sure there's it's a reputable opportunity and that you can, as Dave has said, ROI that, get a return on that investment. Well, all education is that. I had this long discussion with our friend Mike Rowe on his mm -hmm. podcast the other day. I posted, uh, we ended up talking an hour because we're just so much alike. But all we were talking about is he, he really is upset about this idea that we consider education an investment. Mm. No, I'm not. Um, he said, but, but he, he's saying that that's the con. Sure. It's and the it, is, it is pitch. a part of the con. Yes. But it's not. But it is. It can be. It can be. Mm -hmm. And what I said is, is the part of the con is, is that it's always a good investment. It is an investment, mm -hmm. but is it a bad one or a good one? Now, if you go spend $200,000 to get a degree in left-handed puppetry, then that's a bad investment. But if you go spend 500 bucks and you get a degree, you, you up one of your certs, then you got a $5,000 return on that, and they give you your money back too, then that's an infinite return, then this is a good investment. Mm -hmm. And so knowledge is always a, an investment. It's either a good investment or a bad investment. Does it pay you more than it costs you? would be the good investment type. 
but if all you learn how to do is, um, you know, uh, you know, you've got seven degrees in philosophy and so you're a barista, then that's a problem. Yeah. And you're, you're going to struggle with that and you're not going to get the return on investment. Not mad at you barista philosophy students, but just let just saying uh, you don't want to spend two hundred thousand dollars for the opportunity to draw someone else's coffee. Not a plan. Um, and so. And that's not poking fun. It, it's poking fun at the, not the individuals. It's the system and how screwed up it is that we actually told people that that was a good idea. Yeah. And that's what the whole movie, uh, the documentary that we did, that's been so popular. Uh, by the way, thank you guys for all of the things we found out this morning. It won an award. Yeah. So pretty cool. Yeah. And um, who knew? Yeah. But, Our uh, future up for a Webby. Is yeah. that what they call it? A Webby. So is that, is that what that's I, called? Yeah. That's what they call yeah. it. Okay. That's well, you got awards for everything. One thing I want to add to this really quick. There's also on the on the edge of this marketing pitch that Dave was just talking about is also this idea that if I get the degree, that all I have to do is largely send out the resumes and people are going to clamor for me. And that is not true. I just recently uh, spoke uh, on the campus of Vanderbilt uh, just last week, doctoral students. And the Ooh. number one question for me was, Ken, how do I actually get the gig I want? So don't forget that yeah. even with the doctorate or the, the master's the degree, PhD. you are now gonna have to compete you still got a training a, camps just a, over just a tool on your belt you got to win the game you got to win you got to beat the competition and that's what uh we're seeing a trend now people are staying in degrees well if i get this degree well i didn't get a job now i got to get another degree and um it can be valuable but remember uh even if you need it um you're still gonna have to compete it just occurred to me that what we told the whole generation was that you're in willy wonka's chocolate factory and if you get the golden ticket that's correct. You get a free ride. That's what people think. I just and sit back not, and wait it's for not, people. It's not Willy Wonka's golden ticket. Mm -hmm. It's simply a conversation piece. And the knowledge that you got on the way to getting your degree, which Ro brought up an interesting point in that uh, podcast. He said that we use the word degree. Every else, everywhere else we use the word degree, it means a small increment. Oh, that's a great statement. You know, like a degree on a thermometer. If yeah. you change the degree from 72 yeah. to 73 degrees, no one notices. Mm -hmm. You got a degree. Yeah. No one noticed. It's a very interesting <laughs> point. And we act like it's a promise of a better future. Well, it is always good to add knowledge. Oh, yeah. But useful knowledge is called wisdom. Yeah, but that pro that better future has everything to do with what you do with knowledge. Yeah, it's the better the it's degree useful, itself. Useful. Is it useful yeah, it knowledge? Can be. Yeah. Useful knowledge, and the secret sauce to success we told people was a degree, and mm. it's not. No. The secret sauce to success is you. That's correct. You. Yeah. Persistence, integrity, integrity, Con continually persistence, learning. continual personal growth, integrity, persistence, hustle, <laughs> grind. Humility. You're not the answer to the equation. You're just the answer to your equation. No one really cares what you think because you've done nothing yet. Go do something and then have an opinion. Ugh. This is The Ramsey Show. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Sydney is with us, and Sydney is in Phoenix, Arizona. Says on my screen, you're debt-free. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Way to go, kiddo. How much you pay off? I paid off 65000 in 38 months. Good for you. Way to go. And making what kind of range of income during that three years and two months? Uh, in the three years, I started at 35000 and I doubled my income during that time. To seventy. Yes. Wow. What do you do for a living? 
<laughs> yeah, I'm a report, a sports reporter with USA Today. Um, I started at a local paper and then worked my way up um, to where I'm at currently right now. Um, and that all started with my debt-free journey three years ago when I was looking at the numbers, trying to move into my own place and realized that I could not afford it or much of anything. Okay. So the, the debt-free journey says I need to make more money. So you got after it. Yes, so I instantly started applying for new jobs and then uh, land with the company that I am right now and then have been there ever since. So Way to go! Journey, <laughs> yeah, this journey has been a blessing in more ways than I can count. I'm so proud of you. What was the, uh, uh, how old are you? I am 27 years old. What was the debt? What kind of debt was the 65000 um, so most of it was student loans. So 46000 was student loans. I also, um, before the debt-free uh, journey, I was leasing a car. So I turned that back in, got a, a used car, paid that off, uh, student loans, and then some medical bills as well. But majority of it was student loans. You rock, kiddo. What kind of used car did you get? Uh, I got a Toyota, or excuse me, a Nissan, a Nissan Sentra. All right. Nice car. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, good for you. How's it feel to be free at 27? It feels it feels great. At first, it did feel a little surreal just because I've been working towards this goal for so long. Um, and, you know, in the beginning, it just seemed so unattainable or, or borderline impossible. But just working the steps every day, um, you know, of course, it, it was hard, but really just staying uh, plugged in and reaching that goal just feels literally like such a huge <laughs> relief, such a huge weight off of my shoulders. And I feel like it just couldn't have come at a more perfect time. So I'm really, really excited and super grateful. Yeah. Way to go. Way to go. I'm proud of you. So Thank fun. Thank you. Uh, Sydney, I've got to ask you, as a sports reporter, you cover a lot of great athletes. Uh, what is the uh, parallel, the metaphor through the debt-free journey that also applies to champions in sport that you've noticed yeah. doing your own journey? Uh, so right now I live in Phoenix, so covering a lot of the Phoenix Suns who are doing really well. But I'm originally from California, uh, so I will relate it to Kobe Bryant when he talks about that Mamba mentality. Yeah. And even on the debt-free journey, how you say to be Gonzale intense. So just every day waking up knowing that this day, even, you know, I, I worked two jobs during the whole time. And, you know, my day started around five in the morning. Um, so just getting up every day, even if I was tired or, or, or didn't necessarily feel like it, just knowing that this day was for something greater and just having that mentality to, to ch uh, just continue to go after it. Um, so I would definitely say that it took a little bit of mama mentality to, to get that. where I am right now. Uh, an additional, additional to being gazelle intent. Way to go. Good for you. You're amazing. Yeah. You are a rock star, <laughs> man. You. I'm so proud of you. Very, very, very well done. Who were your biggest cheerleaders? Um, I would say I had cheerleaders um, with my friends and family, but I do want to give a special shout out to uh, my two friends, Duena and Maurice. They were the ones who actually lent me your book, Total Money Makeover, and got me on this journey. Um, and we ended up doing it together. So it was really, really such a blessing just to have someone my age doing the same journey on it. You know, when you see a lot of people freely living their life or, or not making these sacrifices that way that we are, it was cool to have that support system on the same journey. We ended up being debt free within a couple weeks from each other. Um, uh -huh. And you will actually be able to meet them soon. They are coming to see you and do their own debt free stream. So Woo, I love it. Them. yeah, they were a really big help during this time. What do you tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Um, I would just say just first setting that goal. And when I set my goal, like I said, it just seems so impossible. But once you set that goal, once you really sit down with the numbers and, and just work the baby steps, it's possible. So I would definitely say trust the process. Um, that was m the most important thing, just knowing that like what you're saying is, is true and you'll get there. It just takes time and dedication and patience. So definitely trust the process is what I would tell everybody out there. Um, even if you think that you can't do it, just fake it till you make it and before you know it you'll be that free <laughs> <laughs> well push through even if you don't know if you're going to make it that's that's different than exactly faking it, you know? way exactly. to go Just having so much faith to do it you're an amazing young woman i'm so proud of you very 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 well Thank done you. we've got a copy of baby steps millionaires for you how ordinary people built extraordinary wealth how you can too that's the next chapter in your story you'll be a millionaire before you know it at this rate well done well Perfect. done well done
Also, another copy of Total Money Makeover. That way you can give it away and uh, stir up a ruckus for somebody else. So good Perfect. stuff. Good stuff. All right, it's Sydney in Phoenix, Arizona, 27 years old, making uh, paid off $65,000 in 38 months, making 35 to 70. Doubled her income while she was doing it. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. I'm debt-free! Yeah! I love it! Yes! Very cool. Sharp young woman. Twice she said in that call that uh, I trusted the process. You hear that from a lot of athletes these days. Of course, she's obviously a sports journalist, but you hear that a lot of athletes across all uh, walks of sport. And it's a, it is a beautiful way to describe the clear path, which are the baby steps. This is a process that works time in and time out. She said, trust the process, trust the baby steps. It is a process. It is a process. And when you do it, it works. Kelly's in Phoenix. Hi, Kelly. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi there. I'm so grateful to be on. Blessings to you both for all that you do and everything you put your hands to for fighting so hard to help people Thank you. Um, live free. Thank you. So I'm considering buying an agency. So um, I have been in my career for 21 years, 22 years, and I'm 51 years old, so I'm considering um, I'm going to have to look at what it's going to look like when I just am just way too tired to be uh, uh, in my career. And so I was looking to buy a company, and I they're going to be giving me all the information I need. But the question I really have, because this is not something I've done before, so I need to figure out how to look for what the ROI is, how much to offer them. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that looks what like. What type of agency? I'm sorry, what was that question? What type of agency? Um, it's an interpreting agency. Okay. All right, cool. The language language gotcha. agency. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, well, a good rule of thumb is this. Uh, four to five times the net profits after everyone has been paid, including the manager. And so if the owner is working in the business and is not paying themselves out and creating the net profit, and then their only income is their net profit, you would insert a manager's salary and reduce the net profit by that much. You see what I'm saying? Yes, I do. So if I wanted to buy that from Nashville and someone else run it for me, turnkey, with someone else operating it, and I'm not over there making all the decisions. There's a good general manager running the agency for me. Uh, what is the net profit then after I paid them? And if the owner's okay. operating in there, I'd have to. That would be an extra expense that's not in the current P and L. Does that make sense to you? Correct. Then your net times your net profit times after that your taxable income times four would be a 25% rate of return times five would be a 20% rate of return. And you're going to want to make that at least on a small business because it's not going to be, it never turns out exactly like you think it's going to turn out. And so that's not a, that's a high rate of return on a traditional investment, but a small business is a much more risky investment. And so if the thing's making a hundred grand, it's worth four to 500 max, max. This is The Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Jeremiah 31, 25. I will, I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Philip Brooks said, I do not pray for a lighter load, but for a stronger back. Ooh. Mm-hmm. 
Uh-huh. Careful there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. You'll get that one answered. <laughs> Deborah's in Gilbert, Arizona. Hi, Deborah. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you so much. And thanks to your ministry, my husband and I are everyday millionaires times two. Way to go! (laughs) For five years, we've been completely debt-free. My only regret is we were not gazelle intense sooner. Would have happened 10 years earlier. Well, congratulations. We're proud of you. How can we help today? Well, I'm... Thank you. So I would like to gift our daughter by paying off her mortgage, and my husband is reluctant to do that. We have more than enough to do it without changing any of our situation whatsoever. I would just like to do it as a gift for our daughter. What's the balance on her mortgage? And I'm wondering, about 130 Okay. You obviously have that in cash out of your $2 million. And more. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, how is she with money? Um, she is very well. Um, she does very, very well. And she's been nothing but a blessing to us her entire life. Mm-hmm. Is she single? She is single. She's mm-hmm. 42, looking for Mr. Wright. If you know one, send him our way. Okay. All right. <laughs> Why um, is your husband object? Um, he doesn't He doesn't have an absolute reason. He just thinks that we shouldn't. Um, it isn't monetarily, because we certainly can afford to do it. And um, he just just not knowing where this world is going and the direction it's going, he's just reluctant to do so. But he does, he can't really put his finger on why. Okay. All right. Well, the, the, people um, that are cut from the cloth that you guys are cut from, I'm one of you, um, Ken is too, uh, we believe in hard work, we believe in sacrifice to win, and that's how you've won. And he's yes. afraid he's going to steal some of that from her. Possibly. Yeah. Uh, I just, I, I would guess. I mean, that would be a normal thing anyway. Um, and I would say mm-hmm. to pay it off anyway. Thank you. Now, here's why. Let, let's, let me add a little bit to it in, in his for his side of the equation, and we'll make it fun for everyone. I would ask okay. her to sign a letter, not a formal document, but just a letter that you keep a copy of and she keeps a copy of that promises that she will mm-hmm. never borrow money in her life ever for anything. If you do this. And th- there is no question that she would do that. Well, she when she finds Mr. Wright, if he's a financial planner, we may have an argument. <laughs> well, that's true. She, she actually quit a job at a bank as a teller because they were required to sell so many credit cards a day. Yeah, well, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Wright could change her mind. I just I want to I want to just put yeah. that out there. So I just want something in my file that she has in her file. And it was a little bit formal enough that it sticks in her memory solid that dad and mom paid off my house, and I promised I'd never borrow money again, so we really just can't borrow money. If you're going to date me, I just can't do it. So um, I'm never borrowing money again. And the reason I want her to do that is so that she's going to, because she's going to inherit 5 to $10 million, because your money's going to double or double two or three more times before you die. Um, and when she inherits all of that money, we want to keep her from screwing it up. And if she never borrows money again and she's only in her 30s, she's going to be a multi-millionaire on her own. Mm-hmm. And so this is for her. It's not for you. And right. it, it, it is for your husband because here's the sale to your husband. If she agrees to do that and then she invests a house payment in addition to what she's already investing and she becomes wealthier than you, earlier than you, uh, you have literally changed your family tree with zeros on the end. And, and I think what you're saying hits the nail on the head, I think, to some extent on his point, because I think he is concerned that she might do that down the road, but I don't believe that she would. But putting it in writing prevents that. Yeah, and it's not a contract, and it's, not a, it's just a right. communication piece. Right. It's like, a, it's like a, um, an oath. I swear an oath. It's the debt-free oath. And you know, that kind of a no thing. there's no question she would honor that. Yeah, she it's an emotional thing. Ma, I would love to do this for you because I know what it will do for you, but it won't do it for you unless you stay debt-free. And so part of me doing it for you is you sign the debt-free oath or whatever. I mean, make it make it corny. I don't care. <laughs> I love that. Deborah, Dave, love uh, Deborah and Dave, I thought I heard you say – Something to the effect of, well, the way this world is right now, he's not sure, which makes me also think that there's a little bit of he's worried that uh, spending this money could hurt them, Dave. I hear no, a little it's bit not, of that. It's, there's no chance of that. Yeah, they're in good shape. Yeah, you've done well. Yeah, you're, you're in good shape. I'm so proud of y'all. 
And yes, I would do this. I, we've had a lot of everyday millionaires, baby steps millionaires, pay off their kids' houses. But you don't want to pay off a kid's house that's going that you know they're doing cocaine, and so that gives them extra money for their cocaine, right? You don't want to you don't want to fund uh, misbehavior indirectly, right? Um, and so it could be financial cocaine, it could be actual cocaine, but I mean, it could be whatever. So if they're out there spending money like it's water, like they're in Congress or something, then we're not going to give them more to misspend. That's, that's just an enabler. That's not a blessing. But in your case, there's every reason here to do this, and I would do it. And it helps you emotionally to go, okay, this is the last step of me changing my family tree permanently. Very cool. Ah, Frost is on the line in Flint, Michigan. Hi, Frost. How are you? Hey, Dave. How are you? Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? I had a career question for you. Uh, My wife is 24. I'm 30. Uh, We got married in January. And um, congratulations. We make about 80. Thank you. Together, we make about 82,000. I work, we both work in uh, sort of the political uh, part of the part of the economy. And um, as I said, I'm making about 40. And I just didn't know what sort of advice you would have for me. Uh, in pursuing other careers that could um, expand my my uh, income earnings. Mm. So are you in campaign side of, of politics or working for a government entity? Campaign side. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I used to do that, by the way. And so that, you know, you're going to you're not going to have a whole bunch of earning potential unless you move into the consulting side of that business, which those folks can make very good money. Um, you know, I think you've got to decide what is it that you really want to do? You know, do you want to step into more political and government work or do you want to eventually go to the private sector? Or are you in a situation right now where you're just going, Ken, I need to make more money. What's the more urgent question that you have? I just want to make more money. Okay. Uh, well, so, so right now, if we're looking to just make more money, um, I tell folks to focus on the talent side of things. I teach there's three elements that every human has, and that's where we get ideas on what kind of work is really meaningful and purposeful. Talent, what we do best, passion, work we love, mission, results that we want our work to produce. For you in this situation, if you're trying to get out of debt or save some money and begin to make a transition, focus on talent alone. So you've got skills and you've got some experience that are transferable at the age of 30, correct? Uh, Yes, sir. Absolutely. So we're looking for, okay, I look at my skill set, and here's a fun little exercise homework for you. So you have a lot of confidence in this decision. I want you to just write out what you think are your top five to seven skills, actual skills in work. You could also include people skills in that list. And then I want you to look at the experience that campaign politics has afforded you and write down your top experience that you think is the most transferable to other parts of the uh, workplace economy. And then begin to look at, okay, that gives me a really clear indicator in what I do best, which is what I'm most marketable for. And I'm looking at job descriptions in Flint, Michigan that line up with that. Now, I'm also going to give you my Get Clear Career Assessment. Hang on the line. Kelly's going to give you a link to this assessment. It's a 20, 25-minute assessment. It's going to allow you to go deep on talent, passion, and mission, give you a purpose statement, which becomes a 35,000-foot view of the world at work. And you can look at multiple jobs that allow you to be on purpose. But I'd start with that talent side of things because what this is going to do for him, Dave, is identify jobs where he's qualified, hot job market, increase that income immediately, and put that to work in the baby steps while he's getting clear on a long-term play. Kelly, also give him a copy of Paycheck to Purpose, Ken's best-selling book. Get Clear Assessments now blessed over 20,000 people have taken that. So if you want to know what you're up for, sign up for that. It's a good deal. Love it. Way to go. That puts us hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey folks, Ken Coleman here. Did you know The Ramsey Show is one of the most popular podcasts in the world? Get your daily dose of advice on life and money. Check out all of our shows from The Ramsey Network wherever you listen to podcasts.